Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. And remember, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome and wanted here today and every day. I'm Connie, and we're sitting in our beautiful pavilion and enjoying um, a beautiful morning in Geauga County. So good morning. So today, a few weeks ago on the church calendar was uh, Trinity Sunday. That was like two weeks ago. Uh, since we've been bouncing around, today is going to be our Trinity Sunday. And then after that, we'll be back on the regular church calendar. Uh, but today will be our, our Trinity Sunday, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, but before we get to it, I just want to talk about the elephant in, the, in society, the elephant in the room, um, is Roe being officially struck down uh, by the Supreme Court. Um, it's anger inducing, it's, it's frustrating, um, it, 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 it's even scary, right? To think about not only the repercussions of Roe itself, but what is next. Um, and what I want to tell you this morning, uh, my best words on this, I guess, uh, is to feel your feelings about this. Uh, feel angry, uh, feel frustrated, um, yes, even legitimately, it's okay to feel some fear as a result of this, but we can't stay there, right? We can't stay in just, in just anger. We can't stay in just frustration. We can't stay in just uh, fear. Um, we must allow that to move us into uh, action of some kind, community action, church action, individual action. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk a little bit about today uh, in our message when we uh, get to that. Uh, I, I'm currently reaching out to UCC churches in neighboring states to begin initiating discussions on what role uh, we might all be able to play together once Ohio inevitably, and it will here pretty quickly, go dark uh, when it comes to reproductive uh, services. Um, so uh, hopefully those conversations will, will engage and we will have possibly an operating plan of what things that we can do as a church. Um, whatever happens, we will resist. Um, we will stand for justice and compassion and mercy, um, no matter what Supreme Court of the United States rules. And with that, uh, let's get into our moment of focus, which is the poem, The Swan, by Mary Oliver. Now I chose this for our moment of focus today uh, because much like our concept of the Trinity, this being our Trinity Sunday, much like the concept of the Trinity, the swan in this poem is a shapeshifter. Uh, it can be soft and beautiful or it can be harsh and relentless. And the poem, much like, in my opinion, the divine spirit, the poem reminds us that change is a natural part of life. Good change, bad change. It's a natural part of life. And the final uh, line in the poem is a challenge, I think, to all of us. And that challenge is, what shape will you decide to take? Did you too see it drifting? all night on the Black River. Did you see it in the morning rising into the silvery air? An armful of white blossoms, a perfect commotion of silk and linen as it leaned into the bondage of its wings, a snowbank, a bank of lilies, biting the air with its black beak. Did you hear it fluting and whistling a shrill, dark music, like the rain pelting the trees, like a waterfall knifing down the black ledges. And did you see it finally, just under the clouds, a white cross streaming across the sky, its feet like black leaves, its wings like the stretching light of the river? And did you feel it in your heart, how it pertained to everything? And have you two finally figured out what beauty is for, and have you changed your life?
be your hand And we'll walk, walk down together Lift up your hands And we'll sing, sing here together chapter 16 verses 12 to 15 and I am reading uh, from the inclusive Bible. I have much more to tell you but you can't bear to hear it now. That used to be my breakup line with people. (laughs) When the spirit of truth comes she will guide you into all truth. She won't speak on her own initiative Rather, she'll speak only what she hears, and she'll announce to you things that are yet to come. In doing this, the Spirit spirit will give glory to me, for she will take what is mine and reveal it to you. So like I said at the top, while today is not technically Trinity Sunday, this year it's our Trinity Sunday. And while I tend personally not to be a fan of the practice of traditional Trinitarian doctrine and theologies. Um, I am, however, particularly attracted to various interpretations of what it means uh, to have a Trinity at the center of one's faith. And one of those sort of perspectives that I really appreciate is from Roman Catholic priests uh, Ramon, Ramon Panikar, and his idea of what he calls the radical trinity. You see, Panikar approaches the idea of the trinity not as just like exclusive to the divine, not just Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, but as an element and a reflection of all of, of creation. Uh, In his book, Blessed Simplicity, he writes that the Trinity is not a monopoly of Christianity. He suggests that all of reality has a Trinitarian structure. In other words, the Trinity is not just the dynamic of God, Christ, Holy Spirit, but also, and perhaps more importantly, its structure is God, people, world. 
or sometimes world might be replaced with the universe or the cosmos. And for Panikkar, this trinity is the equation of reality itself. It's what holds reality together, uh, God, people, world. And the cosmic, all of us, the cosmic, the flesh, and the spirit are all united in community. So the radical trinity then becomes the lens through which we can come to know not just God, but the larger community of the world and the cosmos around us. So a radical community extends out of this idea of the radical trinity. And we can begin to see one another through this lens, as well as, uh, as the, the world in which we live in, we can see all living things and nature itself as all radically equal, just as God, the Christ, and the spirit are radically equal, equal within traditional Trinitarian doctrine. You know, just quick history lesson. You know, some would argue that the Trinity came about uh, out of sort of like this pretzel that early Christians got tied in, where it's like, well, we are we are a people of one God because, and I've said this in many messages. Remember, the early Christianity was a Jewish sect, so it's like we we worship one God, but all of a sudden now, do we have three gods? We've claimed Jesus as divine. Something about this Holy Spirit. And Abba, Yahweh, God. So do we have three gods now? And so Trinitarian doctrine came about as sort of like this uh, a, a pretzel twisting attempt to say, no, we don't worship three gods. We worship one God. They just are all the same. We just call them different things and they have different functions, but they're, they're all God. Some would argue that that is sort of where Trinitarian doctrine kind of came about. That's an oversimplification, of course. But I would be one of those people that would, that would be like, well, you know, we kind of have three gods here and we're jumping through hoops to say it's one God. So that's just sort of a quick, quick history of what it means to sort of abide by a Trinitarian theology that uh, God, Holy Spirit, uh, and Jesus were all God and yet separate. Um, so through the radical trinity, however, we're less concerned about describing God. We're less concerned about making sure that we're only talking about one God. And it's more of a way of describing how you and I should live together. So just like for me, where all theology, once theology becomes divisive and begins separating us from one another, that theology has, going, has gone down what I would describe as a dark path of bad theology. If theology is separating us, if theology is causing us to hate others and to live outside of community, I would describe that as a bad theology. And so radical community is attempts to sort of supersede the problems that can come about from Trinitarian doctrine to focus on us and the community. And of course, it's not a shock to anyone when I say that radical community is not currently the defining nature of our world, whether we're talking about the destruction of our environment or our ongoing struggles around systemic racism and white privilege, or even the troubling response by many people to Giaga Pride, the work of radical community has always been and continues to be an uphill battle, an uphill slog. And it requires us to do the difficult and daily work of self-analysis and the work of personal change and public advocacy. And I will admit, all of that can sometimes feel pretty pointless. When we work and we work and we work and we vote and we do what is asked of us for, for cultural change, and it just seems like none of that works, it can start to feel exhausting. It can start to feel maddening that we're doing all this work and we just keep sliding. It seems like we keep sliding back into oppressive ways. But the model of the Trinity shows us 
that it is absolutely not pointless, that this work is the necessary work to hold reality together, to hold existence together. It is the work of the divine spirit, the work that you and I do to mend wounds, to bring the culture together, to not be divisive, but loving and open. That is the work of the divine spirit. It is the work that calls us to die daily on the cross of compassion and justice and to be re resurrected daily within the spirit of community, within the spirit of the radical trinity. And so to live in radical community, to live within a Trinitarian model of God, people, world, we must engage in the work of reconciliation, of compassion, of justice, of encouraging one another and seeking to live in harmony and peace when and where we can. Meeting with one of the signees this past week of the anti-gay letter that was distributed before Pride, that was not something I particularly wanted to do or look forward to doing, but it was something I felt compelled to do and called to do as someone who does in fact seek to reconcile and build bridges and to live in harmony with the world around us. And it wasn't a happy joy, joy meeting and we didn't walk away feeling a renewed sense of respect and love. It, but it was a start, it was a bridge to reconciliation. But there can be no harmony and peace if we are not actively engaging in this work of manifesting, manif manifesting a Trinitarian ethos within the world. And that can ruffle some feathers, right? Doing the work of justice means that you are probably going to come into conflict with those who benefit and profit from a broken world. And too often this can scare us into inaction. And sometimes that inaction is completely understandable. I have people come to me and say, you know, I, I wanted to come to Pride, but I just didn't feel safe. And I get it. I completely understand that mentality. And when that is the case, it's on some of us others to work even harder to make individuals feel safe in what should be a safe space. But if we mistake passivity, if we mistake silence for peace, we are not encouraging one another, but continuing to live life in complacency while others suffer. One strategy for people is to go to people who are working toward justice and maybe causing a bit of a, of a kerfuffle. And they like to say, you are causing division by doing what you're doing. When the reality is it's not the work of equality that causes division, it is always the response to equality that causes the division, right? Living in radical community means that we are called to the fundamental practice of care for life that is endangered and grief over life that is destroyed, any life, all life. Our culture's ability to normalize mass death threatens our ability to maintain foundational connections of care at the most basic interpersonal level without our even noticing that changes have taken place. This is a danger as well as a reality, whether we're talking about normalizing the effects of the coronavirus, over a million in this country alone, which by any war standards, is a huge death toll. And within two years, myself included in the guilt of this, it's we've, we've normalized it. We've somewhat just have moved on from this trauma of at least a million people dead within our country. We've normalized ecological degradation. We, we just keep sort of adjusting our lives to climate change. We've normalized 
our reliance on 25 billion land animals each year being killed for our food, 25 billion. And we've normalized the continued destruction of black and brown bodies within our country and elsewhere. Now I get it. There's some things we're limited on what we can do, right? I mean, like I said, we, we, we work and we vote and we advocate and sometimes things don't change. So there is limitations on what we can do even as a group sometimes. But that doesn't mean that we should allow ourselves to normalize the trauma or to normalize the death and the pain. That is something that we need to learn to live with and sit with and process. But how do we do that? It's easier said than done. How do we live with that? How do we mend our ways? How do we encourage people when we ourselves do not feel very encouraged? How do we do the work of living in harmony and peace when so much around us is actually disharmony and chaos? Writer and activist Kelly Hayes suggests that we need what she calls a riot of empathy. And she writes this, quote, we need a riot of empathy. We need collective grief as a rebellion against the normalization of mass death because what we are fighting for is our value and our collective understanding of that value. So let's remember who we are and who we want to be as well as who we want to be to each other. So we push back on our culture of death. We push back on our defeats through not anger, not through shutting down, but through increased empathy, increased love, increased compassion. And a lot is going on in our world, and it can at times just feel so overwhelming. Friday, I bought some Ben and Jerry's and I went to town because <laughs> it was just like, I'm. I don't know what to do at this point. But if we allow our hearts to close off or harden in regards to suffering, in regards to political decisions that do not go our way, then we are in big trouble. If we allow our hearts to shut down, we betray ourselves. We betray our purpose as, as people of faith. We betray the collective whole. We betray the ones who are most vulnerable and we betray any hope of a radical community. When so many of us are feeling entirely overwhelmed by grief and pain right now, we must remember, we have to hold on to the importance of community because no one, none of us can hold this much grief alone. And when we try to hold on to this grief alone, we fall into despair and we struggle to find the joy in our lives. Been there. I'm sure many of you have been there. It's so easy to do. But we have to rely on one another. We have to rely on our community because grief work is not solo work. Grief work is collective work. And we are grieving. We are grieving right now. We're grieving a lot of things. It just, it feels like the, the second we, we sort of well, feel like we finish one process of grieving, something else gets dumped on top of us. But we make no mistake, we are grieving right now. And our call as cultivators of life is to keep inviting each other and others within our community into compassionate connection at the interpersonal level as well as at the social and spiritual level. And we need to make this a part of our cultural DNA. We need to make that a part of who we are as a people, as a church, as a community. It's a theological imperative. It's the bedrock of who we are. God calls us to reconciliation. God calls us to community. God calls us to action 
And God calls us to build an active incarnational community where God, the people, and creation are all intersecting and the Trinity and growing together. But living like this can also be costly because it calls us. It demands of us to value all life in a world and in a system that requires some lives to be valued less than others. That's the very system in which we live. Some have the power some don't, and those without the power work for the benefit of those in power. That's the system. But ultimately, we will be able to enact justice and equity in the world because, not because that we're special, not because we know politics better than others, not because we have a D after our name or because there's an R after our name, but we're centrist. Not because of any of that. We will be able to enact justice and equity in the world because we are grounded in the certainty of the love of the divine. No matter what we face, no matter what we push back against, no matter what we advocate for, no matter what we are attacked for, we can stand firm in the knowledge that we are loved by the divine and we are loved by one another. And that is something, for me at least, that is profound and is definitely transformational and life-changing. May it be so. Amen.
children's uh, message that I gave during my first interview weekend when I was uh, speaking at um, Old South. Um, but I think it's one that it, 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 uh, it's a good visual image to help us to understand the importance of community. So, you know, when, you know, if you just sort of imagine that uh, each, each piece of paper is just us, it's us out in the world, it's us doing our thing, working, raising kids, being single, what have you. And a lot of times, you know, uh, when we're sort of trying to do it on our own, uh, and not sometimes, all the time, whether we're trying to do it on, on our own or we're not trying to do it on our own, uh, bad things can happen. Maybe we get insulted. Maybe we lose a job. Maybe anything. You name it. Bad things happen. Isn't it? it comes along. We get we get torn, right? We we hurt. We we suffer pain, and uh, sometimes emotional, sometimes physical, sometimes a combination of all those things. Um, and one of the reasons that community is so important is that the bigger your community gets, a little bit more difficult it is to tear. Now. This is still going to tear, but I, I now have a group of pieces of paper living in community. And yeah, it's still, it can still be torn. It can still hurt, but it's a lot tougher to tear, right? It's not as easy just to rip through it. And the more sort of in-depth our community gets, the stronger it gets, the more loving and accepting it gets. Ultimately, it can be almost nearly impossible to tear through the paper because community creates strength. And when we try to handle things on our own, I, I'm not, maybe I'm too weak. You want to say that? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we get enough people together, but when we try to do it on our own, ultimately we will end up torn and with really nothing to fall back on in order to heal. So when we're, when we're talking about the importance of a radical community, when we're talking about the importance of us existing in harmony with God, the world, and others, this is why. Because when the crap hits the fan, and it will, and it has been, we are stronger together versus alone. All right, well, let's enter into a time of prayer and meditation. T.S. Eliot wrote, I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light. And the stillness, the dancing. And as a community, we pray for the issues around Roe, the difficulties that women and families and transgender people are going to face trying to find proper medical care, proper family planning care, particularly if they're low income. The powerful will always have their abortions. The targets of this are not the powerful. So we pray for everything around Roe. We're thankful for pride and all the volunteers and the positive feedback. And probably even thankful for the negative feedback, which I think made Pride more of a successful event. We pray for the meal kit guests who are dealing with several major issues right now. And as a community, we continue to pray for those we love and those we miss, those who are ill, those struggling with mental illness, those who are grieving, those who are depressed, those who are angry, those who feel lost and empty. 
for those who continue to deal with the ongoing issue of needless and senseless gun violence within our country. We pray for us as a community that we can continue to grow together, to strengthen together, to embody radical community. Because as difficulties and strife and troubles continue to grow, we need one another. We lift all these up. We ask that the divine spirit not only fill our lives and fill our hearts, but that the divine spirit fills those whom we love as well. May it be so. Amen. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And then only a Christian by our love. Love does not demand conformity. Love does not shame difference nor demean deviations. Love celebrates the multitudes of ways to be. Love celebrates the multitudes of ways to love, of ways to practice liberation. And on the shared journey toward the kingdom of God, toward radical community where all are accepted, may we go and do likewise. Happy last Sunday of Pride. May you have a wonderful week, and hopefully we'll see you all next Sunday.